thing. Uh, not, not today's lecture, but probably <laughs> most of what I'll say will be forgotten so that you can remember certain things. So a museum <coughs> is a uh, memory machine, which is first and foremost a machine of forgetting. And then the question becomes, what is forgotten in Museum Europe? Well, I think a lot of things are forgotten. For instance, um, all kinds of uh, politics, forms of politics are forgotten. The fact that when we go shopping at supermarkets, we in a sense participate <coughs> in uh, mass crimes is often forgotten. Well, my, the example I use in the book is uh, that I like to buy a cashew, uh, cashew nuts, but when I do so, uh, I sort of condone uh, the fact that those who pluck the cashew nuts have rotting hands. Uh, and my wife recently reminded me of this uh, after having read my book and seen me <coughs> shopping <coughs> on with cashew nuts. It's very difficult to escape from that because it's so easy to forget that. Uh, another more fundamental thing that's forgotten is politics in a more general sense. Uh, I think what we experience is uh, uh, what I call a depoliticization. And um, first of all, I'd like to make a distinction there between what one might call the political and between what one could call politics. Now, politics in a double sense. The political I take to be a sort of ontological tension, where there are people, there is uh, there are power differentials, there is tension, there are forces, and these forces coagulate into more <coughs> institutionalized forms of politics. Uh, there is a politics in two meanings, although the English doesn't really capture them. Uh, in French political philosophy, there's a distinction between le politique and la politique. One of them refers to what we in the Netherlands would call the Hague, so it's politics in the institutional sense. And the other one uh, refers to a more broad sense of politics and refers to the politics of everyday life, the fact that there is politics everywhere. Um, what we see today uh, is, I think, a reduction of politics uh, in both senses, but also in the sense of uh, the institutionalized form of politics, a reduction of politics to problem management. So uh, there are no real uh, <coughs> ideological issues uh, explicitly at stake. Politics is thought to be simply <coughs> a kind of way of managing everyday problems and nothing more than that. Um, and that leads to the individualization of all kinds of issues and the neglect of uh, the connections between uh, various issues in a complex world. And it leads to a kind of uh, Impera, in for instance, austerity politics. You can uh, have budget cuts in one sector and the other sector uh, won't mind uh, so long as there are no budget cuts in their sector. So uh, artists uh, uh, um, go to the Mali Belt in The Hague to protest, but then university professors stay home and the university professors protest uh, but the moment uh, the student demonstration starts, the professors go home, which was literally the case uh, last year. Um, what the depoliticization I'm talking about also entails is what you might call a sort of amalgamation of uh, politics. And that is to say that political parties nowadays uh, show very little differences between them. Differences mainly come down to <coughs> percentages in terms of budget cuts or percentages in terms of uh, purchasing power that they project in the future. Uh, one example of this fact that political differences between established political parties have basically vanished uh, is the fact that uh, in the Netherlands, for instance, last year, opposition parties came up with uh, alternative budget proposals, and where the, where the cabinet wanted to uh, have budget cuts uh, of uh, 18 billion, all opposition parties came up with other budget cuts, but all leading up to 80 billion, uh, 18 billion uh, budget cuts. So <coughs> the distinctions between political parties are um, uh, negligible in a sense, and they have in a sense all um, turned into one, which, was, uh, which became very clear uh, in the Netherlands with the uh, so-called Kumbu's uh, Accord. I don't know if everybody heard about it. Um, what this comes down to uh, is what I call uh, Operation Obesitas. It's basically the only goal this society has 
is to grow to become fat. That's like uh, uh, an ideal image of a society where, which really explicitly states that there are no alternatives to that course. Um, and that's guided by a kind of faith, uh, a new kind of religion that is uh, the religion of credit. And credit literally means faith. It's called, it's credo, it's, it's faith. So it's kind of self-referential -refer faith. Uh, you might say, uh, uh, Walter Benjamin already spoke of, of capitalism as uh, uh, a religion without dogma, uh, out of pure cult of, of death. Um, now that leads to an idea of democracy as basically nothing more than a kind of accounting strategy. Uh, democracy has become a slogan, you might say. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, something that any self-respecting dictator uh, uh, adheres to. Uh, all dictators are, are Democrats nowadays, and they hold elections, and then are elected with 99% of the votes. Um, there is little fundamental dissensus about the meaning of uh, uh, democracy. Uh, and uh, anyone is for democracy. So democracy has become a kind of kitschy concept, you might say. Uh, at the same time, you notice a kind of contempt for actual forms of uh, democracy. Uh, <coughs> Uh, even in terms of the, the, the more institutionalized forms, if you think of the referenda <laughs> concerning Europe in uh, the Netherlands, in France, and in Ireland, that it was a real contempt for no voters. Uh, in Ireland, where uh, the, the first referendum turned out to be a no, and uh, a, a, a different treaty uh, was proposed, which was actually not a different European treaty when Giscard de Stang said this is a only cosmetically changed treaty. There, the Irish had to vote, and everybody else in Europe uh, and on the political side was saying it's their uh, democratic duty to vote for. Uh, so the kind of paradox of democratic duty to vote in a certain way. Um, similar things happened last year with the reactions to Papandreou's proposal uh, to hold a referendum to, to uh, ask the Greek uh, <coughs> population what they actually thought of, of the austerity measures uh, landed upon them. There, the, the reactions were really, uh, what a, a, a hideous idea. Who came up with this stupid idea? What an idea to, to involve the people in what's happening to them. And uh, a third example, you might say, uh, the, the, the business cabinets that have been appearing in Europe. Uh, in a sense, I have the feeling that Berlusconi, how perverse uh, this is, uh, it was basically the last Democrat in Europe when he said after his application, uh, shouldn't there be elections? Uh, and the Italian uh, government, uh, first of all, thought, no, there, we don't need elections. Uh, so Berlusconi as a, as a Democrat, that's a really typical situation. Um, I think what we see is a, a very strong primacy of uh, financial markets and this uh, religion of credit, which means that political decisions are displaced by economic calculation. And uh, this goes hand in hand with the idea that basically there are no alternatives. And then my question is, which is the question I raised in the book, uh, well, what does freedom mean if there are no alternatives? Doesn't freedom mean the uh, availability <laughs> of alternatives? So the book is uh, a, a critique of that and also an attempt to uh, maybe not think of uh, entire alternatives, but to, re uh, to, to uh, let's say, keep the fire burning <coughs> in terms of the ability to think of new alternatives. Um, current government is a kind of management of problems, and it's informed by uh, uh, a, what I call a neoliberal communitarianism. On the one hand, it's very neoliberal. It, it places emphasis on individual responsibility. Uh, and on the other hand, it's very communitarian in the sense that uh, a larger cultural community is the center of this responsibility. Our responsibility is a responsibility for our culture. And a community at a variety of levels is basically what this individual responsibility pertains to. <laughs> So that's a, a, a governmental rationale that we now see. To that, to that depoliticization and a governmental rationale, certain responses, of course, come. And one of them is populism. And uh, I take populism to be uh, a democratic desire for uh, immediacy. That, that is to say, uh, 
a democratic society is governed by uh, something that is not there, which is the people. And <coughs> populism is the desire for the people to be directly present, to be, uh, to, for politics to be a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, representation of the people, for the people to be directly present, immediately present, which is an impossibility <coughs> because the people are not prior to democracy, they are an effect. It is an effect of, of uh, uh, democracy. Um, so, uh, in a sense, you might say populism is a response to depoliticization because all political parties basically more or less have a similar story that creates room at the fringes at the parties <coughs> for populist parties. Um, so, uh, is, is populism our hope? Are the new political parties our, our hope? Uh, I, I guess, I guess, not really. Uh, because uh, they turn out to be uh, a form of what I call real populism. They happen to be an alibi of politics. There is uh, uh, an essay that I came across later by Islavo Shizek uh, that's called uh, Why We All Love to Hate Haider. And he basically makes the point I make in my book as well, only he did it 10 years ago, I guess. Uh, that is to say that everybody loved to hate Haider because um, Nobody had to think about their own extreme uh, views. <coughs> Haider sort of uh, was a focal point of uh, negative energy, which drew away criticism from the established, uh, uh, from the pol political establishment. So, in a sense, I guess that this populism that we see now is not a real alternative. And the Netherlands is a good example for these populist uh, parties to actually sort of be a part of a pol the political establishment in a very uh, strategic way, in the sense of being included, but not really being included. A, a perfect alibi of government. Uh, government could uh, continuously say, oh, but we're following them closely and critically, and, on, uh, and at the same time, uh, populism was the basis, the founding stone of our last uh, and still current uh, cabinet. So. Um, what I uh, then wish to draw attention to is the fact of uh, remembering one thing, which is that all politics is a kind of scandal. All politics is a scandal because it's the pretension to uh, uh, have sway over the will of others also against their will, and that's the scandal. Uh, politics should have a bad name. I think that the complexity then of today's world means that there is no Archimedean viewpoint. There is no central control and also no critique that escapes from the black hole of capitalism. I guess that's what uh, contemporary capitalism makes clear. All the anti-capitalist values of the 1970s have all been uh, become a part of capitalism. Creativity, authenticity, critique even is all fine. It's all part of the system now. That leads me to say that uh, uh, I have little faith in forms of direct democracy. Um, I guess uh, uh, direct democracy <coughs> tends to pose a problem in terms of uh, participation. In my view, participation, political participation, is not really uh, the solution to this problem of depoliticization. It's not so much participation, it's distance from politics that we need. And distance is the only way to have a critical sway over politics. Participation in politics means being drawn into it and losing a kind of critical distance. So uh, I, I, I think the problem is partly put if it's put in terms of uh, uh, participation and in terms of direct democracy, which really reduce, entirely reduce the complexity of today's world to uh, um, assemblies <laughs> that are based on this very populist idea of the people being present. Uh, but this might be something that we'll discuss because John will speak after me and have, I guess, better arguments for composed participation. Um, so what do I propose then? Uh, I mean, the book's called The New Democracy, which, I mean, there are some, there are some ideas for democratic renewal there. Uh, for, first of all, I think it's very important to stress the idea, of course there are alternatives. The way things are now haven't been this way always. They've actually uh, uh, changed uh, pretty much over the last century, and they'll change again. So of course there are alternatives. One 
uh, change that I propose is a kind of institutional change. And uh, I'm not going to give an example that just it doesn't like. Uh, I, I propose uh, a kind of uh, what I call a council of state. I, I, I say council of state because it's a Dutch or a political organ. It's basically the oldest political organ that we have in the Netherlands. It's not really political anymore. Um, what I propose is to say, well, in effect, today, um, a large part of the political agenda is being determined by both financial markets and by mass media, who basically are very uncritical of, for instance, such things as the, the obvious need for a kind of austerity politics and the obvious need to listen to financial markets and to do this and this and that, uh, which leads politicians to say, well, we cannot but do this because financial markets uh, want this, which are very depoliticizing uh, moves and arguments. Uh, my idea is well, if those uh, systems of mass politics and financial markets have this uh, huge but unofficial agenda setting influence in politics, why not have an institutional change and have a countervailing uh, agenda setting power in the forms <coughs> of, in form of a council of state consisting of a variety of other social systems with a view to the public uh, interest? And I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, art, of science, <coughs> and of religion. So this Council of State, if I were to have any say in it, would uh, consist of representatives from the art world, from the world of religion, from the world of science. And it wouldn't be a sort of council of wise people, though it would be a council that then has to negotiate with public, to, to, uh, to, to do a work of public, for, of the formation of public and which would ha then have the power to raise issues, to say to uh, uh, political establishments, these issues need to be debated. For instance, one issue that's being neglected in the Netherlands now is ecology. The United Nations recently sent a special envoy to the Netherlands to speak about our e ecological isolationism. So basically the, 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 the joke of the world in that sense. This might be an issue that m might be on the agenda, <coughs> if more publics were mobilized and could have a say in this. And this is what this Council of State could do. It could put issues on the agenda. One other uh, 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 part of this Council of State would be what I call sort of critical boomerang public. That is to say, those cashew nut flocking people elsewhere should have a say in our democracy because our democracy has all kinds of effects on uh, other uh, uh, places in the world. Why not bring them home? If we have a per permanent representative at the United Nations, why does not the United Nations have a permanent representative uh, with us? Because our fictive idea that our democracy is closed in itself is, of course, uh, wrong. And all kinds of effects, daily effects, and destructive effects of our everyday behavior need to come back to us in a form of at least uh, uh, agenda setting issues. That doesn't mean that decisions are decided uh, uh, that are made by this council of state, but it does mean that we need to see and debate uh, the consequences of our own actions. Um, and uh, one last thing that I uh, think might be important is something that I'm very much critiqued by, often by uh, intellectuals on the left, is a kind of revitalization of nationalism. Um, that is to say, it's not the uh, uh, nationalism of uh, the 19th century, which led to the formation of nations, but there is uh, in nationalism an important connection with democracy. Nationalism has been the only ideological way of legitimating democracy up to now in the modern age. Uh, now, nationalism is a kind of solidarity based <coughs> on birth and on history. Uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, nationalism is restricted to what we now call nation state, but nationalism has a kind of uh, solidarity based on birth ground and based on history. Why could this not be a solidarity also with a certain ground? And why should, could it not be a solidarity with uh, the world in a larger ecological sense? Why should it be uh, restricted only to persons within certain borders? So the idea of nationalism, there is a potential in nationalism that is very utopian, uh, because that is why nationalists are never satisfied 
the nation is never really there. It's never really, uh, it has never really arrived. So there is a utopian potential, I think, in nationalism that's really being misrecognized by uh, intellectuals on the left. And uh, I think that there is a potential there also for an ideological renewal which would extend beyond the borders of our nation state. I guess I'll leave it to that. Thank you.